As our final session of the eighth Widening the Pipeline virtual training begins, I'd like to take one more opportunity to thank our sponsors, the Evelyn Y. Davis Foundation, the Lenovo, Johnson & Johnson, and Twitter, and Bayer. When journalist Jamel Hill tweeted that the 45th president of the United States was a white supremacist, her friends and family worried that the public onslaught of reaction and White House condemnation would be too stressful for her. But after you've read Hill's best-selling memoir, Uphill, you'll understand how she was able to keep her, her equilibrium and her perspective by saying that it was probably the 25th worst thing that had ever happened to her. Jamel Hill joins us today, and we are absolutely thrilled that she's taken time out to join the widening crew. Uh, thank you so much, Jamel. Uh, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to this conversation with one of my favorite people. <laughs> well, what can I say? Um, I had the privilege of seeing you actually in D.C. last October, and it may have been on the exact day that your book was released or shortly thereafter. So I want you to tell us, give us a little insight into the world of the book tour and how, how you've experienced it and what you may have learned about yourself. Well, it is uh, very different than you know, how I'm used to promoting things, I guess, because I most recently, at least over the last maybe 10 years of my career, have been firmly rooted in the broadcasting space, as in broadcast television. When you go promote a show, yeah, you do the usual shake hands and kiss babies in terms of uh, going on different television programs, different radio programs. Um, but it is intense, um, but not as intense as when you go on a book tour. So I think I did, you know, eight or nine cities over the course of two weeks. And um, it, it was sort of like the days were easily 12, 14 hour days because before the actual book events, all day starting in the morning, I'm doing you know morning radio, morning talk shows, um, national shows, like it's just continuous up until you know showtime where you're talking about the book. So, um, and again, with the show, when you're uh, doing the promotion for that, you're talking about the show and you're talking about some of the topics you plan to go you plan to cover and that's it this is a much different experience because i'm talking about myself all day and while i think i'm interesting i'm not that interesting to where i'm spending two straight weeks just talking about myself and you know you also have to be mindful of like your energy as well because obviously the people that come out and see you at a book event you know that you're going to talk about the book and there'll be a q a but you also know that uh there's a, there'll be a book signing more than likely attached so then that's you know more interaction with people so it it was really um much more intense than i i imagined in my mind i mean this is my first book so i didn't really know what to think or how to feel like it would be but it was definitely um it was definitely very intense but you know, the book buying business or book selling business rather is difficult and you have to promote yourself in a very um, bold way. I mean, you're out there all the time because you got to slang these books. And so uh, for me, um, that part was also like a, a little different. I have a physical product I'm trying to sell. And so uh, everywhere I went, it was just like, buy the book, buy the book, buy the book. And so um it's almost like you have to however normally you think you would promote your work you have to almost put that on steroids and then quadruple it and that probably will give a good um you know a, give you guys a good feel for what it's like to promote a book i was gonna say i saw an instagram reel i think and it's showed you starting out in the morning and went all the way through to the evening and you had costumes or clothing changes and yeah. you're racing into the back of an SUV and it takes you across <laughs> town. It The energy level, you have to, it has to be insane to keep yeah, it. Yeah, it, it is. It is different. Um, but one thing that I was glad uh, for is that my husband went to every book tour stop with me. And, you know, I mean, he's accustomed to me going out of town and, and doing stuff. And he's been with me when I did speaking engagements. But when he experienced this tour, and he said that, okay, now that I see what it's like when you're out on book tour, 
Um, because even when I did just like speaking engagements and say he wasn't with me, if I would get back from the speaking engagements and maybe you have a post reception or you have to meet with, especially at a university, you know, faculty and that kind of thing afterwards, I mean, that's still, you know, a pretty decent amount of time and, you know, a decent kind of day. And if I got back to my hotel and I didn't, you know, necessarily want to have some three hour conversation with him, you know, we would talk and check in and, you know, talk about our days and I'd be like, all right, I'm going to bed. He mm -hmm. said, you know, before sometimes like he would be, um, you know, kind of a little irritated with me because, you know, he's like, okay, so you spent all day and now you don't have any time for me. He was like going through this tour. He's like, trust me, anytime after you're done with an event and you're like, I don't feel like talking. He's like, I will fully understand now. And he wasn't even the one quote unquote working. He's just going through the whole day with me. Uh, most of those days because of, and in some cases doing two uh, book events in one day, uh, yeah, there would be uh, wardrobe changes. Um, typically my day would start some somewhere between four and 5 a.m. because I'd have to get makeup because, you know, I got to go and, and look the part and look all shiny and pretty and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, uh, I'd have to do wardrobe changes because uh, I, you know, I, I being there's a different wardrobe, at least a different vibe between, say, being on Sway in the morning versus doing Watch What Happens Live. I'm, I'm not to be, you know, especially doing these TV appearances, I can't be caught wearing the same thing. They're like, she ain't got to change your clothes. Like, well, what are we doing? So, so yeah, you know, you, you match your clothing to where you're, where you're going. And so sometimes it would be like three outfit changes. I had to bring the outfit with me. And then of course we have the big book event Then that's another change. So um, that's why I said, like, it's a lot more intense than anything I've ever had to promote in my entire career. Well, I want to ask you later about the, <clears throat> That time that I think Ian actually interviewed you at one of the stops. Was it in LA? We'll talk <laughs> he about did. that. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yep, you're right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I want to start, and I usually try to ask folks about their careers and have them tell us a little bit about their path to journalism. But your book is absolutely, I don't know how many of you have read it, but if you have not, it is one of the frankest, most powerful. Uh, first person memoirs, you know, I've, I've ever read, to be quite honest with you. Uh, and I want to zero in first by starting with how and when you knew you were a communicator, a writer. And uh, as we've had conversations through the years, and I, I, even in the book, you mentioned uh, reading the sports pages when you were like seven, eight years old. And there was this one gentleman your mom worked for who used to read the sports pages with you. Tell, tell us about the impact that that moment had? Well, what I would say, the biggest um, impact in terms of how I learned to communicate and fell in love with writing and language and story construction, I think it does all start with reading in particular. So uh, initially when I thought about this question, I was gonna pinpoint when my mother uh, was a housekeeper for the gentleman you mentioned, he was 86 year old uh, white man who lived in Southwest Detroit and my grandmother, she was a social worker uh, for decades, and uh, her clientele through one portion of her career was the elderly. And my mother had started a housekeeping, uh, our house cleaning service when we lived in Texas for a short period of time. And so uh, and cleaning is something my mother's always loved because she's a weirdo like that. She's very, very meticulous. Um, and so uh she you know it was always something that she had a particular gift for and my grandmother thought you know what better way to kind of you know marry her uh you know needing a job with what i'm doing is by you know getting her to clean the homes of the elderly clients that she had as a social worker and so uh, this this gentleman he had a subscription to both detroit um, newspaper, the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News. And so because my mother couldn't afford childcare, sometimes I'd have to go with her. And, um, you know, my job was to be as quiet as possible and to, you know, basically be seen and not heard. Y'all know what that's like. And one way I would entertain myself is by reading the newspapers that he had laying around. And I particularly gravitated toward the sports section because I was into sports. I love watching sports. You know, I was a tomboy. And so that that taught me, I think, to love newspaper writing in particular. But my path into communication and journalism, I think, started before that. Uh, you know, my stepfather, he used to read to me on a regular basis. So I had a pretty 
extensive book collection, um, you know, as a kindergarten, first grade, second grade, like I, you know, I love to read. And so I think reading, the one thing it does is make you curious about the world. And as you know, Rachel, the key component that you have to have, I think, to be an effective journalist is curiosity. And that's what books stoke in you. And so being of a voracious reader set me on the path to being a, a journalist and a communicator. And all of that started very, very early because as I used to devour books as a kid, I used to go to the library, both in my school and the public library. And um, I need to get on this because I've been procrastinating. Granted, the pandemic certainly uh, didn't help, but every city I've lived in uh, as a professional journalist, I've had a library card because libraries mean that much to me. And, um, you know, I think it's important to support the local library because of what it does for the for community and, and just as a gathering place. And, you know, we need to, especially these days with the amount of misinformation, encourage, re encourage reading as, as much as possible, but all, you know, to, to not to further ramble here, but uh, what reading did for my life was, was life changing. And uh, even now I still am a, you know, voracious reader, even though I know you guys see all the <laughs> copies of my books. And I feel like I gotta say this because just a quick tangent, because I've been called out about this a few times, is that people are like, oh, you know, you have, I, we can't miss the fact that you have your book. When you write a memoir or write any book, they give you advanced reader copies, and they also give you dummy copies. There's, in half of those displays that you see, my actual book isn't even actually in there. It's just the front. They wanted me to know what the front cover looked like. So they sent you all these books, and I didn't know what to do with them, so I just Girl, sat up don't worry about the you haters. Know? You ain't got yeah, to nothing. I was <laughs> pasting my walls with the covers of my exactly. book. Exactly. They lucky I don't have a wallpaper like right here with my face on it, like of my books. But I'm like, yeah, people tried to clown me about having this many copies. I know one somebody said on social media, oh, does that mean you having a hard time selling them? I'm like, no, these are dummy copies. There's not even the actual book in a, at least. 90% of those that you see there is just for display. <laughs> I have to jump in and ask you, I think you may have manifested the life you're living right now when you were about 11 and you were writing about LA law. Tell us about <laughs> that. And so, how you uh, thought it was just the, the people in LA all have to drive fancy cars. and have <laughs> So, um, you know, young folks gather around the campfire because I know you guys have probably not heard of the show LA law, but it was a big deal. <laughs> back in the 80s. Like it was a primetime NBC show. Harry Hamlin, I think was a star, Jimmy Smith. I hate that I still remember this, but that's how much I love this show. And it was just about a bunch of young hotshot lawyers who lived in LA. They worked for the same law firm. And much like any television drama, you had, um, you know, people having affairs, love triangles, you know, the occasional criminal act that happened uh, in the setting of this law firm. And just like any good television drama that's built around the profession, the last thing you see them actually do is what's in their profession, right? Like for years, uh, the show uh, uh, was, is every, not everybody, uh, the show with Ray Romano, right? That every, show. Um, Raymond. What is it? About Raymond. Every, everybody loves Raymond. I think, I, I don't want to confuse it with everybody hates Chris. Right? I know. I'm like, yeah, everybody yeah. loves Raymond. Yeah. Something, something like that, but y'all know the show I'm talking about. Um, I, I, uh, yes, thank you. Somebody put it in the chat. Everybody loves Raymond. So as a career sports writer, I thought it was hilarious that Ray Romano was playing a sports writer. He never traveled. He never wrote. He was never on deadline, but he was a sports writer. So that's TV. So you, you have these hotshot LA lawyers and you don't see them really in the courtroom all that often. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting. Um, it was built around the drama of the show. So I love this show so much. And I was really getting into writing because I was journaling and just love to read, as, as I explained to you guys a, a minute ago. So I just created my own fictional drama of L.A. law. But the difference is I put all Black people in it because it was the only Black person on the show was Blair Underwood. And he was a major character for sure. Still fine. He still looked the same. I don't know how this is possible. But <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just created my own world based off what I saw on television. And while I did that with L.A. Law, I would do that with other stories, too. So I was writing all these like mini novels because my grandmother, uh, who was an excellent typist, she started off, I guess, her professional career as, as an administrative assistant. 
she taught me how to type. And so she had an old typewriter that she let me have where I was supposed to be practicing my typing. I was, I was just doing it in the form of writing little mini novels based off my own um, nerdy creativity. Well, so by the time I met you at 16, it was at a uh, journalism um, fellowship apprentice program for high school students. And um, by that point, you had experienced a lot of challenges and trauma, things that I didn't know about. And I told you when you were in DC, I had no idea that you had gone through these experiences. But the one thing I did know is that you were incredibly funny. You had people <laughs> on the floor, literally. So I wanna ask you about humor and how you got to the point at a relatively young age that you were using humor as a coping mechanism. Is that correct? I think that that, that would probably be fairly accurate. Uh, obviously, like most kids, you watch a lot of TV. So some of your humor is derived from that. And, um, you know, I guess also this was during a time where, uh, you know, the parental sensibilities for, uh, I guess I'd be Gen X. I think that's the generation I would be. Um, Gen X's was raised totally different, right? It, because there was, um, it, it was beyond just self-sufficiency, you know, tell you, I was born in the mid seventies, just to give you an idea of the time frame. And I think, um, Gen Xers go right up until like 1980, 1981. And so by the time you were three, uh, you know, you could vacuum the whole house and cook dinner, like, because that's how you're, you know, that we were just, we were just raised a little differently. You know, we had the baby boomer generation who was raising us and they were they were very hard scrabble with how they approach things and you know so for me um being exposed to all kinds of humor you know both the television kind and the fact that my mother my mother had me at 18 so she was still i had the young mom right and so when you have the young mom young moms want to do young mom things so like i went with my mother to see harlem nights not really age appropriate, <laughs> right? And my mother, she had a, a, a date and, you know, I had to go with her because again, you know, babysitting wasn't just in abundance. Um, and we went to see Color Purple. So I got traumatized in that movie, <laughs> right? So um, I say all this to say is that I think, you know, being exposed to different, you know, dry humor, satire, all these different types of things through the TV or movies, um, and, you know, obviously reading some books that were quite humorous, I guess I sort of, some of that sort of channeled in me. And the odd thing is that, and, and maybe this is part of being the only child, when I was at home, my mother, she probably would describe it as I was somebody who, who really kept to myself at home. You know, I was kind of um, an introvert at home, but yet when I got in, you know, out into school and in social situations, uh, then I felt like I came alive a little bit more, maybe because I was so used to being by myself, being around people gave me a certain kind of energy, even though I would never even to this day really describe myself uh, as a as an extrovert, but I have always been comfortable around people. And I think another kind of component to my personality being a little more outgoing um, in some regards, is playing sports. You know, competition really does a lot to bring out, you know, these personality traits. I mean, it makes you confident. Um, it gives you high self-esteem, especially when you're talking about for young girls. So because I always played sports with, um, you know, the little boys in my neighborhood, I played softball and basketball growing up um, and, and eventually fully gravitated toward uh, fast pitch softball, which I played uh, in high school as well. I think those, uh, and I was team captain. So I think all those elements um, was why, you know, I was able to be more outgoing. And the thing about when you're an only child too, you're not, even I had cousins and stuff that I played, uh, like played with and friends in my neighborhood, you spend like actually a lot of time socializing around adults. And that's why like in, uh, when I was in the company of adults, I never felt uncomfortable or shy because you know, I mean, my grandmother loved to entertain, so her friends over there all the time, and I'm around them, and they're asking me questions and stuff like that, and my mother and her friends, it was like, like kind of the same way. So I never had that bashfulness around adults that maybe you typically see in other kids. And wasn't there a high school teacher who said something that got you into journalism? You were, left. tell me about that. 
to. Um, so initially I took high school journalism, not because uh, I had, even though I was still, you know, sort of reading the paper when I could and still love sports and all those things in high school. Uh, I took high school journalism because I was out of electives almost. And it was like one of the few ones that was left. And so I took the class and when you take the class, you they automatically put you on newspaper staff. And I really loved and enjoyed writing. That was another reason I took it. I'd already taken creative writing uh, in high school. And so this was just like another extension of me kind of keeping the writing going. And my journalism teach my journalism teacher, Mrs. Platt, who was mean, <laughs> not all the times, but you know, Mrs. Platt was one of the teachers where sometimes you catch her right and sometimes you catch her wrong. <laughs> and so Mrs. Platt, uh, she was on um, all the entire staff, which was quite small. So it was like a smaller class. She told all of us to apply to the Detroit Free Press Apprenticeship Program, which was a 10 week program uh, that was in the summer. You spent 20 hours a week at the Free Press learning the foundational elements of journalism. Uh, journalism. So they assigned you two mentors. One of my mentors was Rachel. And what you do is, you know, you learn about the profession, about um, how to construct a lead, how to interview people, uh, just all those basic steps that you need to know uh, in journalism. And uh, Mrs. Platt was on me to apply to this program. And I was so sick of this woman nagging me that I just said, okay, I'll turn in some writing samples. I'll write the essay. And what do you know, I got in. Um, and I think, you know, it also helped that the apprenticeship also paid. So you got $10 an hour, which back then I was balling on that. Like 20 hours a week, what? <laughs> I was like, I am buying a bar out, the ice cream bar. <laughs> yeah, so, so at any rate, yeah, it was, it was such a um, mo monumental, you know, sort of start to my journalism career because being able to be exposed to professional journalists um, professional black journalists, like somebody like Rachel and the woman who ran the program, also a black journalist. And it was the perfect storm of events because I did that apprenticeship program the summer that the National Association of Black Journalists Convention was actually in Detroit. And the, um, you know, the person who ran the program, Dr. Louise Reed Ritchie, she took all of us, all of us over to the convention and she made us get student registrations and she made us talk to recruiters for different newspapers across the country. She made us do resumes and hand out our resumes and introduce ourselves to people. She wanted us to understand what it took in order to really succeed in this business. And it took experience. So she drilled into us early, like you need to get internships, you need to keep in contact with people, you need to network. So I was learning all of that uh, at 16 years old. And that was like a huge benefit uh, for me. And, you know, the other element to this is that uh, that relationship that I had with the free press lasted, you know, another decade plus because they had an opening in the sports department, somebody they needed to answer phones and take down high school store scores that appeared in the paper. And you wrote up a little summary of what happened in this high school game. And, um, you know, so I applied to get that job and I got it. So my junior and senior, senior year of high school, I worked in the free press sports department answering phones. You know, I have to say, um, again, as I told you, I had no idea of what was going on in your life. So I mentioned this not to try to, to to get some shine on myself, but what I saw in you was a terrific writer. Uh, I think had I known some of your backstory, I might have been a little, uh, you know, less hard on you in terms of you, <laughs> you can write and you, you do, uh, you know, I would might not have had the same energy towards you. So I want to ask you at this rate, uh, you're re getting ready to go into college. You're deciding that you want to be a sports writer. Talk a little bit about as a woman going in that profession, some of the early challenges. So the other benefit to doing a uh, program like the uh, apprenticeship program is, you know, as I mentioned a minute ago, you were one of two mentors I got assigned. The other mentor I got assigned was a woman named Jeanette Howard, who was a sports writer for the Free Press. And she wrote long form stories, you know, profiles, big picture stories, that kind of thing. And she took me to my first practice. Uh, she took me to a Lions practice because she was working on a big profile of a former Lions coach named uh, Wayne Fonts. He was the coach then. 
And um, the Lions were experiencing a little bit of success. And by little, I mean like barely 500 in Detroit that qualifies as being good (laughs) because of their history. But he was a very interesting character. So she was assigned, you know, to profile him. And just in general, watching how she moved and navigated the confidence she had, that was very impressionable on me because I was so naive. I didn't know sports was something women were supposed to be doing. I had no idea. And the the free press was extraordinary because they actually had a couple of female sports writers on staff. And you just did not see that during that time, not on a consistent basis. This is the early 1990s. Women had barely just gained access to the locker room, to professional locker rooms. So this was a very early time for that. But being around her, being around another um, woman named L.A. Dickerson, who she was a cops reporter, but she used to be a sports reporter. And so being just in the newsroom environment and being around those women, it gave me that early confidence and early sense of belonging. So the early challenges that I faced did not seem as challenging because I I felt like I belonged. And they gave me that sense of that. And I think had I not had that, when those challenges came early on, I might have reacted and responded differently. Uh, it might have been enough to get me to doubt myself or go through some other, you know, kind of challenges, but that didn't happen. But nevertheless, it does happen. And I think the one thing I had to get used to early on in, in my career, and I can't say it ever really left because unfortunately things changed a little, but not to the degree they probably should have. I had to get used to being on an island. And that means going into locker rooms, being either the only woman in the locker room, the only black woman or the only black person. I was going to be one of those three. And so you have to get accustomed to that when you're covering teams and and players. And while the players might all look like you, depending on what you're covering, nobody else covering them does. And so I had to get really used to that. And, you know, the 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 I, it, I wouldn't say it was odd. It was more sort of, um, uh, you know, just kind of another thing that I think that uh, you know, black people, black women have to, uh, or people of color period have to go through is that when you step into these predominantly white spaces, there are assumptions made about you before anybody even figures out whether or not you're good or not. And so I think, you know, kind of one of the assumptions that was made, obviously, if I'm the only one in a lot of these places, and not just the only one in locker rooms, I should say the only one on, on, uh, newspaper staffs too, um, is that there's some crazy wild uh, assumption that um, you got your job because of some nefarious quota system that's happening at these newspapers that I certainly didn't know anything about. You know, they always look at it as um, you, your charity, okay, uh, in these situations, even though to me, I mean, this is why that math, that math is that if it's the case that they are so intentional about hiring black people or hiring women in these spaces or people of color, why aren't there more of us? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it actually should prove to you the opposite. If I'm the only one that was able to get in here, that should let you know how hard it was for me to get here, not the opposite. And so I remember another uh, colleague of mine, or I should say a peer, because we didn't both work at the free press, but when I was covering a college football and basketball, he actually had the nerve to say to me that I had it easier than he did. He's a, a white dude because newspapers and media outlets were looking to hire me and not him. I'm the only black person that was covering this beat. The only one, all right? And I'm just like, how are they more looking for me than you when all I see is you everywhere? You know, 85 to 88% of sports media is white. That's what it is. And so when you have to deal with that kind of um, mentality that's around you, it can impact your confidence, it can impact your self-esteem. But going back to the what I just said a moment ago, because I had that sense of belonging earlier, uh, early in my career, that was already, this, that seed was already planted. Adding to the fact that I have the stubbornness of my mother and my grandmother, I have the Detroitness in me as well, add all those together. And you know, my attitude is going to be more of, you can think that if you want to, but that's not going to make me feel less confident in myself or 
feel like I don't belong here. As far as I'm concerned, that's a you problem. Mm -hmm. And I'll keep getting these jobs and you can keep thinking that they giving them to me, but that check's still cashing. So uh -huh. <laughs> that's kind of what it is. Um, there is so much to unpack and so much for me to ask you about the, the, the memoir. And I want the Zoom hands, start throwing the Zoom hands up. I'm going to open it up soon, but I do have one more question. And that is, again, if you haven't read the book, go out and get it because there's so many powerful moments. And the one I want you to tell me about is when your mother showed you that crack rock. Uh, so, oh, does, go ahead. Sorry. I was just going to say, do you ever, ever have a moment when you think you're so, so different um, based on her challenges, based on some of the things that you witnessed as a child? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've had those thoughts many, many times throughout, you know, my life and career is that I was really supposed to be a statistic, very much so. You know, both of my parents were, um, were for my parents are recovering addicts. Uh, my father and I were estranged for um, a number of years because uh, as he dealt with and um, eventually tackled his heroin addiction, him and my mother were never married and we never lived in, in, the, in the same house. And then later on, you know, my mother uh, suffered through an addiction that, you know, really absorbed a lot of, of my childhood. We were on and off welfare. So between the poverty, the addiction, um, the extensive uh, sexual abuse trauma that my mother suffered, I, I was not supposed to come out this way. And add on the other layer of growing up in the city of Detroit, especially during that time, you know, we're talking about the 80s and early 90s where um, the proliferation of crack uh, was everywhere. And uh, this was a city that often had a much higher unemployment rate than the rest of the nation. A lot of dilapidation, white flight, you know, quite a volatile cocktail that says, I'm not somebody who should have gone to college on an academic scholarship, certainly should not have had the career in journalism uh, that I had, certainly uh, with a mother who had me at 18, should not have been able to, you know, escape out of young adulthood without, you know, being pregnant and changing the course of my life. So it was all these markers that I was an outlier to based off the circumstances that I was born into. And that incident that Rachel is talking about is something that I write about in the book um, because I have one of those parents and I'm sure some of you can relate to this, the do as I say, not as I do parent. And my mother is way... You know, a lot of people have asked me over the years, and especially now that this book is out there and they can read about my complete story, you know, they ask me, um, you know, did you ever think about, you know, either doing drugs, selling drugs, any of that? And I was like, no, I didn't, because the one thing that I can say about both my parents, neither one of them ever made that look cool. They never said they the way their lives was go were going, none of that act looked appealing. It looked like the opposite. So everything I saw them go through and experience and do and the mistakes and bad choices that they made, in my mind, I'm thinking I'm doing the exact opposite of all of that because I don't want to deal with some of the circumstances that they're in that I'm not so sure they're going to be able to rise above. And so when my mother showed me that, it was um, to give fuller context to uh, why that happened. It was because my mother um, was the survivor of uh, the survivor of a brutal rape when we moved to Texas, and she was suffering from a very severe form of PTSD. We move into this apartment on Detroit's west side in one of the worst neighborhoods in Detroit, and in this very dilapidated apartment building that we were staying in, the woman who lived next door to us was brutally murdered. Now, my mother's rapist, even though it's in Texas, was never caught. And she was constantly, despite being thousands of miles away, living with the fear that one day that rapist, who the police described to her as likely a serial rapist, would find her. And so when this happens to this woman who lives next door, um, it triggers my mother in a totally different way. Now, by that time, she had already been doing drugs. My mother was, um, you know, and this is before people really knew this was a, a thing or, or was a danger, but my mother was uh, addicted to uh, to pills. And so, you know, um, she was all, she was in the phase of her life where because of the trauma she'd experienced, she was self-medicating. And after that happened, yeah, my mother who, this was not normally her drug of choice, 
decided that she was going to, to smoke some crack. But before she did it, and by the way, I never saw her actually do it. She showed me what it looked like. And the reason that she did was because she said she never wanted somebody to show that to me and me not know what it was, what it did and what it looked like. So she did the opposite. Um, that was her way of trying to brace for what she felt like would be, you know, eventually for that moment where I might be approached to, you know, you know, do drugs and I would be too naive to understand what was happening. She wanted me to know exactly what it was. And so she did. And it was traumatic for me in the moment, to be perfectly honest. Um, and, uh, you know, I, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> never got approached, never was in those circles where that was ever an issue. But it was the only way that she knew how to parent through this trauma. And, um, you know, it was, uh, to me, an indication that, you know, my mother was in trouble. And I did not know if she was ever going to be able to come out of that. I have to, to urge all of you, if you get a chance, to take a look at Jamel's Red Table Talk with... Um, why am I blanking on her name? Uh, Jada. Uh, Jada, yes. And her mother, <laughs> because Jamel's mother joins her. And I have to say, I, I was sobbing by the end of it. The power, Jamel demonstrates the power of love and forgiveness uh, in, in such a, a beautiful way. I, I would urge you to check it out. Torrance, I know you want to jump in here. So let me let you <laughs> ask the first question. Dang. First of all, Jamel, it's so nice meeting you. One of my OGs, Delano Massey, told me a lot of Ah, that's so, the homie. Tell him yeah, what's up. Yeah. He told me about how y'all came up together. Just wanted yep. to, you know, salute all of the work you've done. I mean, I had several other questions. I'll go back to those, but I first want to ask, like, how have you, I feel like growing up in poverty, being Black, and all of the things associated with that as a form of PTSD, how have you navigated your trauma as you continue to ascend within your career. I feel like a lot of people talk about the climb, but they don't talk about the, the toll mentally and spiritually it takes on you to navigate those different phases of your journey. Like what has kind of steeled you through all of these different things to just endure and be as strong as you are today? Well, um, uh, and thank you for saying that. Uh, I think for me, that's why my career in journalism and writing was such a safe haven. I mean, it, it really, uh, journalism saved my life. I mean, it really did because uh, it's the one thing that I had an intense passion for, I was good at, and I was willing to work as hard as I needed to work to do it. And having it requiring me to have a certain level of focus, drive, determination, and ambition probably kept me away from darker moments uh, that I could have certainly experienced given the fact that you're right, that we are all, if you grow up in certain circumstances, you're going to be living with a certain level of trauma and PTSD that does show up. And often it shows up in places you don't expect, be it personal relationships, um, situations you may encounter. And if you don't recognize or not self-aware enough to know what's happening, it could be quite debilitating. Luckily for me, I had a very positive outlet in having a career to focus on and you know, wanting to be the best at that. And uh, I think distance also helped. Um, you know, I, I've lived in six different cities. I've traveled the world, gone to like 38 countries. And I think doing that and exposing myself to, um, you know, different cultures and different cities and different countries has been very soothing. You know, my, my, my vice, my biggest vice is travel. You know, and I think a part of the reason I love it is because uh, especially traveling to to different countries, um, you know, maybe more so than traveling domestically, is because it forces me to stop and slow down. The communication method is not going to be the same. You don't have access to the same things you're used to in daily life, sometimes not the same conveniences. And so it forces you to kind of, you know, sit with you and, and um, have like a different kind of experience that you might normally. Uh, so I think that was very helpful. I also think it was helpful for me um, that, uh, as the old phrase goes, you know, friends become family, you know, Rachel's like a family member to me, even though, you know, this, she's my mentor, but she is like a family member to me. So having these people that are placed in your life, um, especially those people who are able to see something out of you that you didn't really see in yourself, 
that also is something I think that eases that PTSD. And let us also not forget, there's this wonderful invention called therapy. And so I've also done some therapy. Um, I've been, you know, I lived in DC uh, in 2018, found a really good therapist there. And thanks to Zoom and everything, you know, we still, um, you know, talk. And so I think that has helped me sort of unpack some things. But because, uh, you know, I, I would say the way my PTSD probably showed up is in it uh, being very difficult for me to be vulnerable. Um, and, um, you know, it's something that I still have to actively work on. And that's why I think one of the best things I did was to get, you know, married, especially getting married later in life. Like we've been married almost four years now. And I think that was very helpful that I got married in my forties after I, you know, traveled the world, made career decisions that took me to different cities. I could, you know, slow down and really expose my, uh, expose myself to another person. And so I think, um, you know, all of that has helped me to deal with the remnants that probably still remain from my childhood. Gabrielle. Hi, Jamel. I just want to say hi. I'm Gabrielle Suttles. I'm a reporter from PolitiFact and I'm a native Detroiter. So I have to say, what up, though? Hey, what please. up, though? <laughs> <laughs> All of the above. And also, I love you. I uh, have loved you for years. So I'm, I'm kind of freaking out right now, but it's fine. Uh, <laughs> and I, I was racking my brain because I'm like, okay, I know I have a professional question for Jamel, but really, at the end of the day, I just wanted to say hi. <laughs> and also, <laughs> that's totally fine. That's too. That is completely fine. Uh, but I also, Wanted to know, like, as a Detroiter, I 100% know everything that you are saying when it comes to that Detroit energy, you know, you don't quit, you you cannot quit. Um, it's just not what we do. And so being in a professional setting and being in, for me, this is one of the hardest jobs that I've ever had, being a fact checker and all that. I would love to tell you more about that later. But, <laughs> uh, you know, how do you sit in the room and similar to what Torin said, and not get phased. You know, if you're in a new situation, um, which still I'm navigating some new things as I'm learning, um, you know, how do you not get phased? So I wouldn't call it not getting phased because I, I think it's okay to allow yourself uh, to feel what you're going to feel. So I, I don't want to tell you to deny your feelings or deny if something bothers you or, um, you know, kind of, uh, uh, feel like that you have to robotically approach things. You know, what I would say is, and this comes with time and experience, what you will learn is that a lot of the problems that you experience at job A, they're there in job B, they're there in job C. Um, you know, people often ask me about my experience at ESPN, uh, which was great, you know, by and large, uh, despite the awkward, awkward way we kind of parted. But all the networks are like ESPN. All the corporations are kind of like ESPN, where you have people that will support you, people will put you in good positions, but you're going to have microaggressions. You're going to have um, people that doubt you. You're going to have people that undermine you. You're going to have people who sabotage you. You're going to have Black folks that uh, are skin folk, but ain't kin folk. Like, it's literally everywhere, right? So you cannot fool yourself into thinking that these problems do not exist or they wouldn't exist if you were not at another place. And I think what you really have to manage as you're in these new situations, well, one, you have to be strategic about everything you do. News, uh, you know, media politics, politics inside your places of work, work are, are a real thing. And so you have to be strategic about the tribe that you build at, build at work, building mentors, building allies, you know, people, um, um, sponsors, as I like to call them, is like, you know, which is a much different relationship than I think a mentor, you know, a mentor is a sounding board, a mentor, I think you can, uh, the right mentor, obviously, that you can, um, you know, vent to, be frustrated with, whatever, but then you have sponsors that you need action from, people who are in rooms that you're not in that can bring up your name for a challenging assignment, for, you know, a, a certain, uh, you know, um, promotion, you need those people as well. So you kind of have to understand the mission and you do have to take personal feelings out of it in this regard is understanding that you're in a conditional relationship. Your job is to provide a service for them 
And even though this is tough to say because journalism is personal for, for all of us, that's why we're in it. You know, I, I've, I've said this to other people who are not journalists and kind of are trying to understand our profession is that this is going to sound really hokey and very Pollyanna-ish, but most of us got into it because we really did buy into the brochure, which the brochure said, you know, we're the watchdogs of society. We're supposed to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Um, that we're supposed to be the checks and the balances, that there was something noble about this, that we wanted to tell other people's stories. We wanted to highlight the rights and the wrongs and understand and underserved communities, the communities that we come from. We wanted to sow the fullness and the joy and the wholeness of Black people. Like We got into it for all these reasons that are kind of emotional, that kind of, um, it's what makes us good writers or good editors is that we want to feel passionate and connected to the material that we're writing and editing. And all we want is for the people we work for to feel the same way. And then we learn they don't. <laughs> that, that for them, it's a business. For us, it's personal. You know, this film is totally going to date me because you guys probably have either never, never heard of it and certainly never watched it. But it's an old Nick Nolte film called North Dallas 40. And this is about this broken down professional football player who um, is coming to terms with the fact that of what football has taken away and what he's put himself through, a whole lot of um, midlife crisis crisising happening. And he said a line I'll never forget. He was telling this, I think it was to his coach. And he said, every time I say it's a business, you say it's personal. And every time I say it's personal, you say it's a business. And that's pretty much sums up what working in corporate journalism is like, is you are working for people whose objective is to make money and not tell good stories. And that's going to constantly put you at friction and at odds with the people. Um, you may, of course, you'll run into great editors and, and great management and, and that'll happen, but you'll find that increasingly those are outliers. And so you'll find this consistent fight that's always happening. And while it may be draining and exhausting, the fight is always worth it. And so that's the part that you have to keep in mind is that knowing that inherently you're on two different pages because you have two different goals. Like your goal is to tell a great story and to highlight something important um, and to be of record on something important. And their goal is to make money. How can we get more eyeballs? How can we get more clicks? And you have to be able to win enough in those environments that gives you the fuel to keep going. So I know I probably won't win the war, but if I win enough battles, I'm going to be able to keep going. And what you try to do is position yourself enough so that you can do that. You're going to need to keep you here till like four o'clock, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so much to ask you, but I want to maximize this, this, last few minutes and Laura you had an interesting question and then we'll go to to back to Torrance Laura yeah hi sorry I typed it because I didn't want to like hog any time um first of all my name's Laura I think you're so cool I'm also kind of freaking out my hands are so <laughs> TMI my hands are really sweaty <laughs> I'm sorry anyway um so I just I don't know I while you were telling us your story I actually saw a lot of like my own experience in yours and, you know, um, I grew up in rural West Texas. Uh, my mom is a Mexican immigrant. And so I spent a lot of time going with her to clean the churches and like be seen, not heard, help her out, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Like I definitely, um, I feel it. And so I guess what I'm, so <laughs> basically long story short from West Texas, I went to grad school in New York. And after I got my first job in corporate journalism, I realized that like, so many people who are there are either like Nepo babies, Ivy League people who just have connections and have no brain, like, and like, I just experienced so much, like, to, just to keep it like nice, you know, and it's like, it's so frustrating, because you like, work so hard, and you're so smart, and you just like, never had that same opportunity, you know, that kind of a thing, that feeling, I'm sure we all feel it. Um, And, you know, and I just find like, as time goes on, I don't want to use the word like angry, but I mean, it is kind of anger where it's like now, like, so I work, I work with Gabby actually. Um, mm -hmm. So, but for a different part. So I also work for Pointer, but I work for a part called like uh, media wise and we teach media literacy to teens. Um, or actually like I help teach teens how to teach other teens media literacy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's like with that going on and we talk about kind of these outreach things, like um, first of all, like my management's great, but like, I kind of find myself in this more unique position where I'm like, well, how do we get to these kids that like, don't have internet still maybe, or who like need these like really accessible free things. And sometimes like, 
you know, it's like, it's a valid question. People are like, yeah, 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 that's true. But, and I know they care, but at the same time, it's like, I feel like because we don't share that kind of life experience and struggle and like know what that shame feels like of like not knowing what's true and like those kind of things. And they just can't get, get there is what I typed out. Like they just can't get the point and they never will. And I just don't, like, what do you do? (laughs) Like, what do you do to cope, I guess? So I think, um, uh, you know, what? it has helped me, um, because it's, it's funny because, you know, we, we wouldn't be in journalism or in media fields if we didn't have a certain optimism about the world, but yet the longer you're in journalism, you've become the worst pessimist ever. (laughs) So it's like this really weird kind of dichotomy there. What really has been great for my spirit is hanging around activists. And I don't mean social media activists, Twitter activists. I mean people who are on the ground, people who've been pepper surveyed, people who, um, you know, have had attacks and threats on their lives and they're trying to just make the world a better place. Because I am startled, amazed, in wonderment, in awe at the fact that when I talk to them, they have the most optimistic attitude I ever heard of, despite always seeing the worst part of people. And I'm wondering to myself, how is this possible? And it reminded me of something, and I'm just loosely paraphrasing that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, which was, we have to create the world as it should be and not worry about what it is right now. And that was very meaningful for me because we can, especially that we're in the unique position where we do have access, most of us, to the right information or sort of right information, and we know what bad information looks like, uh, that when we overwhelmingly think about all the problems in this country or in our own communities, it's very easy to get discouraged and want to just say, you know, um, the aliens, please send the rocket ship now. Though they ain't really messing with us because Earth is ghetto. But that's beside the point. Um, the, 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 what I would say is that that's why I think it's good to focus on, on the small victories because that's what gives you fuel. You know, every teenager you talk to will not, uh, or not every, a, a lot of them, let's just say the majority of them may not understand the mission and why you're trying to do what you're trying to do and reaching them. But I promise you one or two will. And those one or two are going to let you know it at some point that you really changed them. You planted a seed in them. That's why I'm so glad that I still have, um, uh, uh, that I'm still friends with uh, with Rachel because she might not have known how she would have impacted my life. And I think it was important for her to know, you know, in my acknowledgements in my memoir, I thank my teachers. I thank a lot of them. I named them by name because I wanted them to know because God knows teaching in the Detroit public school system, you probably hear 70, 80% of the stories you hear are probably failing stories, right? And so because of that, that could get very discouraging where you are in that kind of profession and you think that what you're doing doesn't matter or it's not having an impact. I wanted them to know, no, it, it really does. It just, it may not be the perfect success rate that you like, but you did enough of it that was A, more than probably the average person could even do and that doesn't make it small. You know, it, it it takes sometimes, I mean, I just brought up Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I mean, it takes one person literally sometimes to change the world. And uh, that's why I think it's important, despite the barrage of negativity that we get from social media and just from watching the news and consuming media overall, I, I have to remind myself often, the majority of the country and the world, they're not on Twitter. They're not. And so we get to thinking, I mean, people are awful, don't get me wrong, but they're not that awful. They're not as awful as like social media would have you to believe is that for as many times as, uh, you know, I've been called a racial slur or something else derogatory on Twitter, nobody has ever run up on me and said that to me. They probably know better, but that's beside the point. So, but what I'm saying is that, you know, in real life, people are not as awful as you think they are just based off social media. So What I would say to you is that as you get frustrated and as you have these moments, you have to give yourself moments of gratitude, moments of reflection. And when you can think about the good things that have come from the things that you've done, that you've done, because you have to find a way to give yourself the fuel to keep going. And so in speaking with some of my activist friends, 
you know, it has really encouraged me to do that more because they see more <laughs> things that I could not imagine. But when they get 50,000 people to sign up to vote or somebody comes back and said, you know, I wasn't thinking about voting until you came to my doorstep and you convinced me to do that. That means so much to them. And so I think the small victories can really give you the ammunition and the, the optimism that sometimes you feel like is waning. For me, it was covering reproductive health and reproductive justice and, and talking to midwives and people like that. You know, we're going to keep you till five after because we've got okay. two more questions. And okay. So we'll try to rush through those. And that would be from Brittany and Torrance. So Brittany. Hello. Um, I just hey. want to thank you so much for your time. My name is Brittany Johnson. I'm an investigative reporter um, in Sacramento. Um, have your book. Mm. Uh, thank you. <laughs> you know, my question is going to be about your book. Uh, there's so many questions that we can ask, but I do want to know, as I'm reading it, I just feel like I'm sitting down talking to you one on one, just very, what's up, girl? This is what I, <laughs> you know. Um, so I want to know too, why did you decide when you're sitting there, okay, I'm gonna write a book? How did you decide this is the tone that I'm gonna take with my book? And also you are very open in your book. At what point did you decide and how did you come to that decision that? I'm going to lay it all out. I want people to know everything about my life. And how did you come to the decision of this is what I am going to include, but I'm going to keep some other stuff out? <laughs> well, um, once I, you know, signed the contract to write the book, um, just my personality. I mean, I, I kind of only know how to go with, with something I'm passionate about, especially this is my story. There's only one speed I'm going to go. And I'm going 90. I'm on the Autobahn with it because I'm writing it with the idea there's not going to be a part two. <laughs> so I got to get this all out there. And considering that most people who know me um, in the public space, they just know me as somebody used to work at ESPN and somebody once pissed off Donald Trump, somebody like something in a very limited way. They have no idea the journey, the trauma, the elation, the, the work that went into getting me to this point. And I guess the broad phrase from Drake, they wasn't shooting with me in the gym. So they don't know. And so it is, I mean, up to me, I think, to inform them what that journey is and to see that there's probably more relatability there than they would have uh, imagined. Um, I actually got some really good advice when I was still, uh, you know, before I really even, I was still very much on the cursory edges of, of writing this book. Um, I had some really good advice from Rick Ross, of all people, <laughs> about he was working on his memoir and I had interviewed him uh, for my podcast. And he had told me that as he was, I don't think he was actually writing his memoir, but just is doing his memoir, um, that he broke his life down into 16 parts. And it was just like, yeah, I just broke it down. And then sort of almost like a puzzle where he's like, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened. All right, maybe this goes better here, here, here. And that was really helpful. It really worked. <laughs> and I just did my narrow mind to 12. And uh, then um, what also helped was I, I was, I definitely was somebody who uh, probably read more fiction than, than, um, than memoirs, I should say. I read nonfiction, but not necessarily memoirs. That wasn't a genre that I was ever super big into reading, unless it was, say, Michelle Obama's book dropping. But because I was very curious about storytelling in this format of a memoir, story construction, you know, the, the craft stuff, I was very interested in how people were doing that. I read a bunch of memoirs, and I intentionally... Um, often chose memoirs of people whose memoirs I wouldn't even thought about buying. Like I read Demi Moore's me memoir and it was great. Sally Field's memoir was phenomenal. Um, and so that was, that allowed me to visualize what my, what I wanted my story to be and the tone I wanted it to feel like. Um, I wanted people to, um, you know, I, I wanted people to feel at ease, but I also wanted them to feel the emotion and vulnerability on the pages. Because I'm not necessarily someone who is naturally vulnerable in real life. 
but on page on the pages I am. Uh, and I always have been from my journal writing to the stories that I've written, the columns, you know, I've always been able to say or write what I could not often say. And I wanted to make sure people understood that connection. And in terms of what to leave out, um, you know, I started writing this in 2019 uh, and my book was delayed a couple times because of the pandemic. And a lot of people have told me that who have read it, that, you know, they were like, I kind of wanted more. And I'm just like, oh, but that's good. Because as a writer, that's how you want them to feel. Like there could be more. And, um, you know, I, I realized I could probably write another memoir just on what's happened to me in the last five years. <laughs> so uh, maybe there will be a sequel, but you know, I'm not going into that with that thinking. But I wanted to, you know, really leave in uh, or really focus on the parts that I feel like shaped me, focused on, on you know, kind of um, the things that I still think about. And yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't much I felt like I left uh, on the cutting room floor. Before Torrance asks his last question, I have, feel like I have to secure a promise from you. This group of journalists is going to be meeting in D.C. at uh, March 26th through 29th. So we may need to ask you to do one more quick Zoom. <laughs> oh, okay. Talk about salary and how to negotiate. Just the real deal. Oh, my favorite you- conversation, the negotiation. Conversation. Tell us about ESPN <laughs> and you know whatever. So, Torrance, go ahead. I mean, she could pull up too. Bring the bring bring the buzz. Come on, you from the beach? <laughs> bring the buzz. I'm just I'm, I had to shoot the shot. All right, <laughs> hey, shoot it, shoot it, shoot. I got you. <laughs> so you know, so it's a it's a two part. Pardon me. I, I, because I think I'm trying to keep her here like I am. I am, I, I am, but but I do think you know, as a black woman, I would love for you to speak to ownership of your intellectual property. Listen, I'm gonna be all the way frank. Ooh. I know we're gonna record a line, but I feel very conflicted about some very valuable ideas that I have and giving them up to corporations who might not have the same investment within me that I have um, for journalism in the game. I just wanted you to kind of briefly touch on the importance of ownership of your intellectual property. And when you had that aha moment, when you realized, you know, your purpose was much bigger than ESPN and and sports and and how, and and how you are able to form a business model around your, your brilliance. I I just think a lot of times we give so much of ourselves away um, and we don't get that return on investment. So I, you know, I didn't understand money growing up. I didn't understand how to build credit. I didn't have financial literacy. So as we're entering this new era, I would love for you to kind of just kind of give us some game on just kind of how to monetize our art and our brilliance in, in our culture. Um, um, well, I think the first thing, uh, and I'm just taking pages from what's happened to me. And by no means am I saying this is this is my this is your blueprint, because I do think you all both have some advantages and some disadvantages at the same time in terms of how you build yourself uh, into a business. Because, well, number one, the one thing I had to realize, and I realized this before I got to ESPN, maybe right before when I made the transition from being a reporter to a columnist, I started to see this. And it was more, it was really a financial awakening. I think what happens in journalism is that uh, there is this kind of conditioning, some might say brainwashing, where we are constantly told that uh, there's some nobility in working for either free or close to free or just not what we're worth. I think Black people are just told this period, right? And we know our relationship with free labor is a little bit different than everybody else's. And so um, it's in this country, for sure. So there is that conditioning that happening that happens that makes you feel, and especially I think it's more pronounced if you're a woman, um, where they try to make it seem as if you're being aggressive or too ambitious or too demanding. If you just want to be able to eat and pay your rent at the same time, <laughs> right? You just, they, you know, they do, they try to, they try to make you feel bad about this. And ESPN fully got me out of this, but I started to realize this, uh, when I was a columnist, the big reason I became a columnist had nothing to do with wanting to be 
that kind of writer. It had everything to do with me looking around the industry and seeing a certain trend that was happening. All the columnists were getting all the book deals, the radio shows, the multimedia opportunities. And while I didn't necessarily see myself on TV, I did know I wanted to write a book eventually and put myself in a position where I could earn a higher income in a newspaper. And the best way you could do that is by becoming a columnist because those are typically the senior writers and they're usually rewarded with the bigger salaries at the paper. So I made a money move. And, you know, it was a little uncomfortable in the sense of you have been taught, we aren't in this for money. The people who tell you that are the people who usually want to exploit you, okay? They're the number one people who tell you that. And that's not to say money can't be the primary reason that you're in journalism because boy, did you pick the wrong profession. But it to act like it has no impact or should have not be a factor in the decisions that you make is really trying to set you up to be exploited. So I make that decision. I go on to ESPN. And once I go on, uh, around ESPN, being in the company, because I've mostly been, uh, you know, I certainly had friends that went broadcast television as a print reporter, but being in the company of mostly, mostly broadcasters, broadcast TV people at ESPN taught me a lot about money because they would tell me things that they were asking for in their contract. And I was like, oh my God, I would not have had the audacity to ask for only five-star hotel accommodations, which I did in my contract later on once I had a couple under my belt, <laughs> uh, all first class, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Y'all not gonna have me a car run across the country and sit and, uh, <laughs> treat me like I'm the cargo. That's not happening. <laughs> so they would tell me about all these things. They would ask for it. I was like, you could do that? And then it really clicked. I was just like, you know, when you go and you have to have that conversation. And luckily I got to a point where I did not have to have it. My agent did, because I've had representation for a while now. Um, but when you go in and, add, but I, you know, up until that point, I had to negotiate my own contracts. You psych yourself out because you think what you could be asking them for two cent more an hour. And you're like, oh, if they, if I ask for this two cent, they're going to fire me. They, they're going to take this offer off the table. And so you literally talk yourself out of the money. Trust me, whatever you have in your mind, somebody has asked for something so outrageous that you just like, this is nothing. <laughs> okay. And I promise you, they didn't pull the offer. And I promise you, they didn't fire them just for asking for what they were worth or what they felt like they were worth in that moment. What means more though than what you're worth is leverage. Leverage is the number one key. And when you were asking me about you know, intellectual property, the thing is, that can only happen with leverage. You know, Because most of these companies, they want to keep your IP because that to them is sort of the, sort of the end game. I am. Uh, I created this podcast network with Spotify, the Unbothered Network, which is centering Black women um, and you know discussing the full gamut of of who we are. You know, obviously it'll be Black women who be the podcasters. It's Black women who run uh, who run the network. And there was one podcast that we really wanted. It's a great podcast, and uh, it was a mental health podcast with a, a very well known therapist. And she knows the game. And she, the first thing she asked was about IP. I already know how Spotify is because they're the ones funding this. And I knew they would not give her what she was asking for, but she was in a position because of how she had independently constructed her podcast because of her following, her following, she could tell Spotify no. And I didn't tell her this, but she made the right decision given the position that she's in in the marketplace already. She doesn't necessarily need them yet. And and she, I think they would have, now they have a little more give in them as it relates to intellectual property. But I was glad it happened that way because after that, I had I was able to use that as an opening to have that conversation with them and say, listen, we're talking about signing, you know, Black women podcasters, most of which at this point in their careers have been underpaid, who have been putting in a lot of work. And you're coming in here knowing that their podcast are not going to break the bank for you when you pay God knows how much for Meghan Markle and for the Obamas to do podcasts for you. And you're not only not paying them something that what I would consider to be life-changing money, you're asking them to give up all of their ideas. That math ain't math. Okay. And so they understood that and they've, they've become much more flexible. And even with a podcast that we licensed, the Black Girl Bravado, they have built their own um 
they built their own listenership. They they have retreats, their own fan base. Like they built themselves. And when it came to that IP, it was much more flexible as opposed to what we went through before. But to your point, it's like you have to be able to, when you have the leverage, use it to get everything that you have gotten and then some. And always approach a negotiation. I'll say this before we wrap up, that you're going to outperform that contract. That contract is not what you do, what you have done. That contract is about what you will do. And so it's not about the past, it's about the future. Otherwise, they wouldn't be giving you a new contract. So yes, you deserve an awesome raise and other all perks that you hadn't talked about before. But always understand that when um, when it comes to that, is that you're going to, as you probably have everywhere you've been, you've probably always outperformed every place you've been. So you have to treat yourself that way when you approach these, you know, negotiations. I think it's really, really uh, important to look at yourself as a commodity and a business. Um, and I have said this many times before, I became a much better, better journalist when I became a much better businesswoman. So we'll save the bulk of this conversation for March. <laughs> I, I, see, I, see, I, know, I know you about to, what, what, no, 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 no. Yeah, we, we're going yeah, go ahead. We're going way too large. Uh, Jamel, you embody the saying when the mentee surpasses the mentor. Well, whatever, Rachel. <laughs> it is a powerful moment. You are one of the most powerful voices in journalism today. And you have also proven to me the power of mentoring and what it's the value of mentoring. Uh, you if I don't mentor anybody else in my life, the fact that I can say that I have known you all these years and have somehow given you something that made you as fabulous as you are, it's a beautiful <laughs> thing. So thank you so much for joining NPF Widening and the Widening the Pipeline crew. And we hope- Yay! To <laughs> I'll give her a, a <laughs> oh. round of applause. Well, thank you guys. Uh, thank you all for for your time, your attention, your wonderful questions, and yeah, I'm I I hope we can do this again in March. So take care, everybody. Alrighty. No, I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Okay.